Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I should perhaps say a few words about my uh, experience, uh, apart from being the, the chief architect of the Swedish reform, so that you can sort of situate my my experience uh, correctly. I've um, been a number in a number of countries, uh, but most of the time, in short visits. My actually, my longest involvement uh, is in the Ru Russian Federation. Uh, we started a bilateral uh, project between the ministries of finance in, in Stockholm and Moscow, actually rather soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union in late 1991, wh where I worked for a year. Uh, my colleague, uh, who was more patient, uh, actually continued for 20 years. and. Uh, um, um, been, I've also been in a number of transition countries in Eastern Europe, um, um, but apart from that, um, visits to countries in Africa, like like in West Africa, um, Senegal, Mali, and and Rwanda in East Africa, Tanzania, there have been uh, short visits. So I'm certainly not an expert on Sub-Saharan Africa. I want to make that clear before I start. Uh, about the book, I enjoyed reading it very much. Uh, I believe most people who have been working in this area will recognize themselves when reading Matt's account of the problems that we encounter. Um, so I, I certainly wouldn't question the diagnosis uh, at all. I've seen most of the examples that he makes in, in, in um, various countries at different levels of, of development, so so it's um, I mean unquestionably a very a very good account of, of the problems of um, development um, aid in the area of institutional change. Um, where we perhaps diverge a bit is more on the on the remedy part of the of the message. So I'll get back to that later. Um, could you hand me that so I can managed um, see okay I, I have a somewhat different way of, of um, presenting the the factors that I believe important to the success or failure of, of um, reform attempts um, and I've subdivided those factors into those that belong to the environment that are givens and those that you can affect by your design of a reform, reform project. So uh, to the left you find a number of, of uh, factors uh, that you have to face more or less. Uh, and uh, the most important of these is the existing power structure. Um, if there's anything that I believe that, that Matt should have developed more, it's the, the sort of the discussion of the obstacles that you meet with when, when uh, trying to push a reform project into uh, an existing power structure. Uh, because anything that will make a difference will hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as already Machiavelli uh, stated, uh, uh, he who wants to change something will, will face fierce opposition from those who support the status quo and lukewarm support from those who, who support the ref reform project. Um, and so, um, where whatever project you deal with, you have to sort of draw the map yep. who are friends, who are our enemies uh, in this uh, area. And the geometry will be very different if you are, for instance, trying to pull a uh, agricultural policy reform project through Parliament and the, uh, a budget reform, because in the agricultural case, you have a very small but well organized lobby. Uh, the farmers' lobby, uh, which gives rise to certain problems. Uh, in the area of budget reform, you have a vague but broad resistance, and those two situations <coughs> call for very different strategies. Second, uh, a crisis helps uh, because that generally makes people more uh, uh, interested in, in discuss di discussing alternatives, but it certainly is not sufficient. I mean, we've seen a lot of countries experience a very deep financial crisis without altering their, their institutional frameworks, uh, Southern Europe in particular. Uh, 
the third factor uh, is uh, the availability of empirical research. Um, I found it extremely helpful to scan the research literature in the area where I've been involved in reforms. And it's just this effect that in some areas there is a wealth of literature. Um, uh, agricultural reform, for instance, I mean, uh, you have no difficulty in finding arguments. There are so many deep analyses why agricultural policy in most industrial countries is perverse and should be, should be uh, reformed. Uh, whereas if you're in the labor market policy area, for instance, the, the results are much more diffuse and, and you, you have difficulties in finding strong arguments. So that's again a, a given. I mean, either the empirical research that you need is there or it's not. And you cannot uh, master research in, in a short time. I mean, it takes decades to, to produce a significant uh, background of, of empirical research. So those are the givens. Now, to the right, you have <coughs> factors where you can actually affect the situation. And um, the first, the reform climate. Uh, somewhat paradoxically, it's my experience that it may be easier to pull several reforms uh, through Parliament uh, simultaneously than doing them one at a time. Because that creates a, 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 a general preparedness for reform. Uh, it also neutralizes the lobby groups that resist reform in different because people get fed up after some time by hearing all those, <coughs> hearing all that noise from those who who are um, uh, against reforms. That 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 it may be easier. Uh, Sweden entered such a climate in the 1980s. I would say we dismantled uh, textile quotas. We dismantled our agricultural policy. Uh, we started a pension reform and then big tax reform, etc. And p people simply got used to the idea of change, which facilitated also some rather deep uh, reforms, in, uh, for instance, in the budget institutions. Uh, the second item on the right, the, the design principles, and I have an example here. Uh, I found it very helpful to pull together a number of simple, um, almost moral rules that uh, wanted to guide the reform uh, project. And uh, of course, they have to be tailored to the reform that you, you are dealing with. In this case, fiscal policy restrictions should be self-assumed. Uh, you should not blame the outside world for the, the things that you are wanting. That's the problem in Greece and to some extent in France, that the politicians are not prepared to assume responsibility for what they are trying to do. Okay. You have to translate overall for fiscal policy go goals into micro rules that are meaningful to civil servants at the individual level. You should have the parliament actively involved in decision making because otherwise this reform will not be politically stable in the long run. I think that's the most important factor explaining why the Swedish reform has been stable now over 15 to 20 years and has not been seriously questioned by any uh, important politician actually in parliament. And then there are some more technical things that have to do with the specific budget area which I'll, which I'll leave. Uh, the advantage of such a design is that these things are so natural, so nobody would dream of going against any of these rules. Uh, but once they are in place, you can draw some rather sharp conclusions from them, um, which we did uh, to the surprise of some people. I think. Um, fairness uh, of varying importance, I would say, very important in, in the Nor Nordic countries, where we have a very strong egalitarian tradition. But I mean, again, uh, the, the, the violent opposition that you find in Greece uh, currently uh, has to do with, with lack of fairness, I would say, because the, the electorate at large does not perceive the, re the, the decisions uh, uh, as fair. Um, the very, in plain language, poor people have to take too large part of the burden. Um, in, in, in Sweden, we published with every budget document, we published uh, a, a 
a genie analysis of the proposals put forward so that everybody could see how the, the various proposals affected the various deciles, incomes and deciles. Uh, so full transparency on the uh, distributional effects. Okay. Packaging is another thing. Uh, I hope to have this diagram here. Uh, this is a good example of successful packaging. Uh, this is the benchmark uh, that uh, I, the benchmark analysis that I made of Sweden's budget process in, in 1992 uh, using von Hagen's uh, format. Um, and uh, the, the arrow at the right marks Sweden's position between Italy and Greece, as, as uh, Matt uh, told you earlier. And uh, this diagram essentially made the reform because it sort of concentrates the message that something has to be done about this, this, uh, uh, the, this budgetary system. Um, and the, the, the list of, of things that we checked uh, using this questionnaire was actually also the blueprint for reform. So, mm. so we got started that way. Okay. Uh, finally, and perhaps um, here I go somewhat against Matt's uh, message. Uh, I believe that successful reform requires a core group, a, a rather small core group uh, of dedicated people in order to be successful. And that core group must consist of both experts and politicians. Mm -hmm. Experts because you need the knowledge and politicians <laughs> for legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And for any of those reforms that I just mentioned, pension reform, tax reform, uh, textile quotas, etc., and this budget reform, I can name you a handful of people who were sort of the drivers of those reform attempts. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of budget reform, uh, uh, three people, uh, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Persson, who was later the, mean the pri pri Prime Minister, the State Secretary, uh, Anita Sten, um, uh, who is inc incidentally now his wife, uh, they were not a couple at the time, as far as we know, but uh, <laughs> maybe the reform united them. <laughs> um, and myself. I mean, the, the, I mean, the three of us made this reform. And I, I couldn't have accomplished this without uh, the minister, of course. I mean, yeah. no civil servant can carry anything through the parliament. But Mr. Persa would have been helpless without my design. So, so I mean, it's, it's a mutual uh, dependence. Now, if just to widen the, the scope somewhat um, to, to the world outside Sweden or, or outside developed uh, industrial countries, uh, why is reform so much more difficult, as, as Matt vividly describes in his book? Well, I mean, anything is more difficult in, 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 in developing countries. The infrastructure is worse, uh, the, the general level of education is lower, and so, so I mean, we should, we should expect difficulties, but I believe in the area of institutional reform there are three particular dimensions which are important. And the first is that it's, it's diff <coughs> more difficult to mobilize a sense of public interest uh, in, in, in many developing countries. Uh, I mean, here in Europe we take it for granted that, that there's something like a national perspective. Uh, but we tend to forget that that took us something like a thousand years to establish. I mean, in the, during the Middle Ages, uh, Europe was reigned by warlords, and it took some rather brutal nation making for at least 500 years because before we saw a modern national state. And, and those are, of course, uh, intimately connected with the idea of public interest. That is something which is absent then in many countries. Uh, there is suspicion about public institutions because there are weak democratic traditions, of course, and, and the state has been used as a vehicle for, for, the, for the ruling strata against the majority of the population. I mean, it's difficult to generate confidence in such institutions, obviously. And thirdly, there is generally weak transparency. And the more I've been working in this area, the more important I come to believe that transparency is. It's really a, a very strong instrument for generating support 
uh, broadly for reform parties. And, and it's just a fact that, that we don't have the same traditions uh, in the field as, as uh, uh, particularly in the Nordic countries. I mean, uh, you know about the Justitie Ombudsman, which we created 200 years ago. We have uh, public as um, access to, to uh, documents in the administration, etc. And those things are absent here. Journalists live a dangerous life in many countries around the world for this particular reason, because they contribute positively to transparency. Um, so if you want to improve, you have some three very difficult to bend dimensions to work with. Uh, OK, let me finish on this uh, sort of more provocative uh, comments on, on Matt's book. Uh, um, Matt calls for adaptation gradualism. Uh, Okay, I would say, uh, but there's a danger in adaptation, of course, uh, because any reform attempt needs impetus. Uh, and if you are too adaptive, there is a risk that you get stuck halfway through and that mm -hmm. you will not reach the, the, the goal. Okay. Uh, because of the existing power elites that are in place uh, and, and who will tend to to counteract this and sort of to, to pull the brakes uh, anywhere along the road where they are find it possible. Further, uh, we are recommended to look for hybrids versus well op optimal solutions. Okay, uh, I say, but sometimes hybrids uh, combine the worst features of the two components that form the hybrid. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, there's a risk in that design as well. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, I stressed in my presentation of the sort of Swedish reforms that I believe that any reform attempt has to have a small group of entrepreneurs. I, I, I entirely sympathize with Matt's recommendation on broad engagement, but if reform attempts fail in industrialized countries, I believe it's often because they lack this core group of devoted people. I believe more in commando forces than in battalions. It is too short. Okay. Further, decentralized versus centralized. I, I mean, <coughs> you can't tell really. Sometimes you have to be centralized uh, in your approach in order to su be successful. And we find many examples in history where, where decentralized approaches simply didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, on the, I believe perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of this is to reform the donor community I itself, as you stress in your final chapter. Uh, there are so many entrenched habits and routines and interests that we have to struggle against. Uh, I both at the at the sort of the national level, there's a lot of nationalism uh, governing the the donor community. There are a lot of private firms making money from current institutional uh, channels, etc. And of course, also at the individual level. I'll finish with this sh very short little anecdote. Uh, one of my colleagues working for the IMF a couple of years ago visited a, on a mission uh, one of the poorest countries in West Africa. Uh, and uh, coming from the IMF, he went to the Ministry of Finance and he found a number of people. After some time, he found that the actually the ministry consisted of three people, uh, I mean, doing the work. They were working with paper and pencil. They, they, they were literally putting together the budget using paper and pencil. But there was also an expert uh, financed by the IMF. I don't remember if he was an IMF staff or, or a consultant hired by the IMF. Um, and my colleague asked him, well, so what are you doing here? I mean, what's, what's your project? Yeah. Um, I'm introducing accrual-based accounting. <laughs> 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 and, and, and my colleague said, 
what, what's, what, what's kind of nonsense is here, here are the people sort of trying to put, put together a budget on paper and, and you want to teach them accrual-based accounting. Um, I mean, what you should do is give them a, a PC and, and teach them to put it on an Excel sheet at least, I mean, to get the sums right. Uh, and, and the response he got was very uh, symptomatic in a way, that you've got to have visions. <laughs> 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 and of course, if you look at it individually, I mean, from his personal career perspective, it was quite rational. Yeah. I mean, he, he wouldn't make a career within the IMF by, by uh, sort of proudly testifying that he helped these people uh, putting the budget into an Excel sheet. That wouldn't fall his career. <laughs> but writing a, a nice uh, stuff paper on accrual based budgeting, that helps. So yeah. mm. We sure. face large difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I used no, my time. That's great. Thanks very much, Per. That was fascinating. Matt. Um, <laughs>